So, um, well, good afternoon and welcome to the Dilworth City Council Candidate Forum. Uh, my name is Cale Dunwoody. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and I'm joined today by Claire, who is our Public Affairs Specialist at the Chamber. Um, we're so glad to have the support of the Building Industry Association of the Red River Valley. And Bryce is here tonight um, from that organization. Uh, they're a co-host for... Uh, this event and all of our other candidate events. So we're very thankful to Bryce and her team for that support. Um, I'd like to also thank the candidates for participating in tonight's event. Uh, and thank you to the city of Dilworth for hosting us. Uh, and thank you to everybody in attendance for uh, for joining us. Uh, the chamber is uh, proud to offer this opportunity to voters uh, and candidates to connect with one another. Uh, before we begin, uh, I would like to note that the chamber does not endorse any candidates for uh, office or a political party. Um, our mission is to create educational opportunities for our members in the community like this. Now let's jump into the outline for uh, this event. Uh, each candidate will be allotted two minutes at the beginning of the program for opening remarks and one minute at the end of the forum for closing remarks. During the question and answer section, candidates will, candidates will be allotted 60 seconds to respond to the question. Claire will be timing the candidates. Um, she has a little iPad over there that she'll hold up and it'll make noise. Uh, upon each response, we will then proceed down the line uh, in order that the, uh, the candidates are sitting and rotate who answers the first question. Uh, we ask that candidates be respectful of the timer uh, to allow for uh, many different questions uh, as possible. So uh, we're going to jump into the introductory for two minutes um, and we'll start with Julie. Well, Thank you and to the chamber um, and to the leadership folks up there and Bryce, thank you for the opportunity um, earlier too to meet with your organization. Um, so I'm Julie Nash and I grew up in Dover. I moved away for a while to go to school and start a professional career and moved back here in 2000. So I've been living in Dover since then. Um, I work at NDSU uh, in the provost office and people don't really know generally what a provost office is. And so what I do is faculty development um, and work with faculty success on campus to make sure everyone feels included and belonging on campus. I live in town uh, with my husband and we're quite involved in the community. I've always been involved in organizations and volunteering since I was young. And um, and with that, my, my family is involved too. My husband and two sons are also on the fire department, so um, we're, we're very committed to the success and, uh, of our community. I um, enjoy being an active participant in organizations in our community, because I think that's the way to meet our neighbors and to find out what's going on in our community and be involved. And so I have appreciated that opportunity over the years through all the committees, organizations, and activities in town. Oh, just a little bit about myself. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye. Hi, I'm Mike Rader. Uh, I'd like to echo Julie's uh, thanking the chamber for hosting this event and also uh, the, the candidates, uh, Julie and Kevin. Thank you for your service already to the city as being incumbents and for Matt and Matthew and myself who are trying to get ourselves into serving for government. Uh, this is a great forum and <laughs> looking very much forward to it. Uh, I grew up. Born and raised in Dilworth, graduated from the first uh, graduating class of DGF High School in 1992. Uh, moved far away from the community for a while in Fargo, uh, and then about six years ago, found my way back uh, into Dilworth and couldn't be happier to be here. Uh, always loved uh, the community, everything about the people in it, uh, the fact it's a smaller town connected to a bigger town where so many more opportunities to do things of that sort. Um, my wife has a daycare business, home daycare business in Dilworth, so we're invested in the community also. Uh, I've been working with uh, Johnson Brothers Liquor Company in Fargo for 24 years. Uh, I've been a sales manager for 22 of those 24 years. Uh, so been embedded in the community. Great to be back in Dilworth and very excited to get a chance to possibly serve my community. Thank you. Matthew. I'm going to start by echoing their... Uh, Sentiments. So uh, thank you, everybody. I'll just. Um, my name is Matt Ingbrecht. Um, I was born and raised in a little town called Marion, South Dakota. Um, 
went out to the Navy for a while, came back, uh, bounced around until I met a local gal. And uh, she's from Lisbon. And we just moved around from Fargo to Moorhead and then finally plopped right here in Dilworth in 2017. And we love it here. Um, what I do is I work with hard case vets who have interesting challenges uh, getting into the VA system, getting uh, their benefits, um, counseling. I kind of do it all for the hard case guys. Um, I started my community service, like the official stuff, working with planning and zoning. I'm on the Dilworth Planning and Zoning Commission, and I started that early 2023, and I'm continuing with that right now. And that's Thank you. Yep. Bill candidates in the chamber, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I've been looking forward to it for quite some time. Uh, my name is Kevin Peterson. I'm running for re-election to the Dilworth City Council. Uh, graduated from DGF in 2001. Headed to St. Cloud State University for a couple of years and then found my way right back. I've uh, been living in Dilworth uh, since 2011. We bought our house live in town with my wife and my two children. Uh, when we moved back to town, I have been a lifelong member of Dilworth Lutheran Church, where at that point, uh, got back onto some committees there, uh, including stewardship and long range planning. Uh, I'd have to say that long range planning committees really helped me out for my role in city government with tackling and formatting, you know, current and future issues and challenges so that served me very well um also a member of the door fire department in my, in my seventh year on that so very much looking forward to the opportunity to serve the community once more uh if re-elected would appreciate your vote my name is matt bauer i was born in breckenridge minnesota similar town to Dilworth. i moved away i Moved to multiple different parts of the country as I was younger. Moved back to the area in about 2012. I got married and in 2020 decided to buy a house and we decided to settle down in Dilworth. I like the size of the community. A uh, little bit better than living in Fargo, a little smaller. I, I really like the, the feel of the community here. And I just like the opportunity to help serve the community and try to help improve things in our, our local community. And, and I'd like to thank the chamber for inviting us here and the current council members for their service to our community and the other candidates for coming here and meeting with us and giving us this opportunity to get together and, and answer questions and see what the voters think. Great, thank you. Well, we're going to dive right into uh, questions here. Uh, and we have a number of different subjects that we will dive into. Um, this one will first start with Mike uh, and then work our way, way back around. Uh, this November residents will consider whether to approve a, a half, cent, uh, half percent local sales and use tax to help finance the construction of a new and modern multifunctional community center. First, do you support this tax and, and uh, then explain a little bit of reasoning why. Uh, I, it's funny you started out with this. It's kind of a kind of a big deal going on right now. But, uh, I do support the tax because it seems like the best way to fund it, rather than on the back of just the Dilworth residents. The fact that some of the money will come from outside the city, people <laughs> using uh, shopping in the city is a little bit I'll pay for that. Um, I I do believe there's some unanswered questions about this. I think this is uh, an extremely huge opportunity for the city. But in order for this to become a reality, I think there would, there needs to be a lot more transparency on what exactly the plan is for this community center. I think uh, a lot of people want this. I think the funding set up right. There's just some unanswered questions right now in my mind that need to be cleared up if this is going to be put to a more piece. Thank you. Matthew? I've never been a fan of taxes. I'm going to put that out there right now. The lower the taxes, the better. But in this case, um, I've done research. We've talked about it a lot during the planning and zoning commission meetings, especially. It's time, I think. 
or something of this nature in this town because we're growing and with added investment of populace into this project it's also going to spur other economic growth to businesses other things coming in and it'll make us more attractive to outside investment and to outside people who want to come here to spend their money so thank you kevin i'm absolutely an advocate of the local option sales tax when it comes to a funding vehicle for a project like this to have the opportunity to be able to defer costs to our taxpayers is something that is absolutely paramount. The other option, if this doesn't go through and the majority of the people in town want to go through with the project would be to have to levy for it, which inevitably raises everyone in town's tax dollars on their property taxes. So going with the local option sales tax is the prudent no brainer option as far as keeping the levy low, helping offset costs for Dilworth residents and the overall success of the project. Thank you, Matt. This is something I agree with Mike on. Before you go ask people to vote to approve a tax, I think you should give a clear plan of what you want to do. We've been given hypotheticals of what this community center would be, but no clear plan of what it actually will be. It might have a walking track. It could have a basketball court. It could be a lot of different things, but there's no clear plan. To ask us to vote to just give you a blank check without telling us exactly what we're getting, I, I don't think that's responsible. I think it's the right way to pay for it, but I think the voters should know exactly what they're getting and what they're voting to pay for. Julie. Yeah, so we know with our um, previous community center that it had a regional impact, right? Because a large percentage of the users um, were from outside our community. It was a resource that um, was widely used. And that's why I do support it because it, it's not only people in our community paying for the community center, but it's also people in the region that have been using our community center that would continue to use it. And as such, it, it is. Um, imperative that they help pay for it, right? That's why we put it up that way instead of doing like a levy or something like that. Um, I also think it's a huge opportunity for our community. This is an opportunity where um, if this is what we want and it gets voted in, then we come back to the community and ask even more about what you want to see as part of it. Like this is the first part of it and it can be so much more. So starting with what we had in a better format and then moving forward from that. Great, thank you. Um, the city has purchased land. Um, I should say we're sticking on infrastructure here, but uh, the city has purchased land on the north side of town for a new regional park. Um, just talk about the priority of this park and uh, please speak to your vision of what this park would be. And we'll start with Matthew on this one. Uh, okay, I live on 8th, 8th Avenue Northeast and we just had this about um, 8th Avenue Northeast going all the way from Walmart, all the way down to 60th. And as part of this is the park right in the middle. And I envision this park as something that is a landmark for the entire community. And hey, let's go to Dilworth and what are these beautiful park? And then we'll spend our money. So it would be a very good economic impactor. We also have to let it with what do the citizens actually want though. So I think we need to do a lot more planning and figuring out exactly what this park and what the vision of citizens have for this space. The land that we purchased on the north side of town is absolutely crucial to unlocking development north of Dilworth. We've been moving to the east. We've been infilling on the west side. To build on the north side, there needed to be an amenity. To have that land now in our, you know, in our purview, in our possession, 
is huge for us. We'll be able to make that look however we want. We can build it from the established neighborhoods on the north side to the north to 8th Avenue, build it in sections for what makes sense to developers. Keep the cost low for the taxpayers. When 8th Avenue goes through, most of it will be funded through private investment, aside from the stretch that goes through the park itself, actually. So, uh, great. Thank you. Matt. Yeah, I, I think the park in that neighborhood should basically be developed in the way the people in that that are going to be living in that neighborhood would want it to be developed. I, you know, I don't personally have a opinion on what we should put there. That's not one of the major issues I have concerning Dilworth right now. But I think the developers that decide to build in that area should have a say in what they think will fit that neighborhood best. Thank you. Julie. So it's a long time vision that park going north. It's you know a continuation of the green space as part of the school district. Um, and it helps do some of that can fill in our town and help reconnect with some of our existing neighborhoods. And so for priorities for what I would like to see it used as, like I have ideas, everyone has ideas, but I really want to see us come back again to the community to see what the needs are, you know, whether or not it's more walking trails, flooding hills, um, ballpark, whatever it is, I think it needs to be um, something that we bring to everyone. So this is our investment as a city to say we're committed to bringing that, to reinvest in our neighborhoods, and to give um, our community somewhere that they can take pride in and go to and um, spend time in our own community, um, getting out and recreating and during the day. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a great centerpiece for what will be probably a, an excellent addition to the city. Um, it's, I've been looking at that field for many years now because it's just straight west of where I live and I will miss my sunsets, but that's just fine. Um, if you look in Woodbridge, uh, Woodbridge has a, a fantastic park. I mean, it's kind of the, the cornerstones of those neighborhoods. So this it's uh, it's a great idea and a great idea moving forward for that development. Alrighty, sticking uh, with the last uh, kind of bit on infrastructure here, um, <clears throat> kind of putting a, a wrap on all this, what additional infrastructure projects and amenities, like the ones we discussed, would you like to see added to Dilworth in the next five years? Uh, and for this one, we'll start with Kevin. Additional infrastructure. Well, there's a couple studies going on right now that I think are very interesting. Um, MnDOT is going to come through and redo Highway 10, right? That's that's going to happen the 20, starting in 2027. So there is a study being done on the north side of town, uh, 15th Avenue, for that for that to be a possible detour, and then to pave that from uh, 336 all the way through in the morning. So if that were to happen, that would be fantastic as far as infrastructure goes. Um, other things that we need to invest in, we collectively have spent a lot of money on mill and overlaying some of the uh, more historic roads in town. Those need to be taken care of. We need to we need to get that seal coated and uh, you know protected for the future so that those roads last. Great, thank you. As far as the amenities go, on. We talked about the community center. I'm not opposed to some things they say would be ideas for it. the indoor and walking track. You had an indoor basketball court, some facilities for the kids to be able to go do things during the winter and keep warm and be active. Again, the, they're great ideas. They just never laid these out as plans when they actual plans when they talk about the community center. And putting this boat out there for the tax on that community center, if they actually laid it out, it would be a great idea. Not at all opposed to any of those things. It would just be nice that we knew that's what they were planning to do, not just an idea for something possibly in the future. Okay, so I have a 
again, I, I want the get out and walkability and do things. So I'm really interested in reinvesting in the sidewalks and the missing sidewalks in town and, re, you know, um, investing back into those areas, especially in the older neighborhoods of town. One of my priorities, I am excited about the Highway 10 reconstruct. I think there's a lot of opportunities to make our downtown area um, more friendly to people coming into town. Um, reinvesting in the other parks in our community. Uh, our park board has done a great job of investing in them, and I want to continue to see that in some of the other neighborhoods, not just in our new neighborhoods that we got to invest everywhere. Um, but I mean, I could keep going because I'm like, I would love a community garden, like where we could do something like that. I know we have an herbal garden in town, but I think there's a lot of ways that we can help people connect in their neighborhood. Like, kind of staying on the road, uh, construction aspect of this. I mean, taking a drive around Woodbridge, uh, the roads are in not the best shape in the world. Uh, there's some, uh, there's some big bumpy stuff around there. And then, then talking about the Highway 10 project, um, I've done some research into this. Um, there was a lot that went on in like from 2021 to 2023 about this. That was a 193-page report that was online that I went through on it. Uh, you know, 7th Avenue Northeast and Highway 10 is probably one of the most dangerous intersections of town right now. And there's a ton of our school kids taking a left turn to go to the window for early school every day on that. Uh, and of course, in that project that is that is taken care of. Uh, really just the, the road infrastructure. A uh, little big question I have, I guess, would be uh, on the positive side, yes, the roads, but on, on the question side is um, a little leery of having one lane into traffic going through the Army door. Um, you know, obviously having 15th, 36th with a leave and some of that, but uh, I think that's a general concern. Matthew. Constituent concern, bathrooms and parks. That's what uh, some people that I talked to about alluded to. They want bathrooms so their kids can go. Um, I'm actually on 15th Avenue Northeast, uh, that study from 336 to Moorhead, and uh, we did our third meeting just uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. And um, we're looking at many options to pave that, uh, mostly looking for who's going to pay for it. And um, but with that is another route to get to Moorhead. That's not Highway 10. And that would be the biggest infrastructure thing that I want to see is another route so that people on the north side, like myself, can not hit Highway 10 to get to where we need to go in front of Moorhead. Um, a number of you had mentioned uh, this uh, study of the Highway 10 corridor, so I'm just going to jump right to that since it's put into the conversation and kind of just dive right into economic development. And so um, this one, we'll start with Matt. Uh, in 2023, a downtown uh, develop, uh, Dilworth uh, reinvestment study was conducted. This report suggests that improvements to the Highway 10 corridor could boost economic development and citizen retention in the city. If elected, how would you work to promote the findings of, of the study? To be honest, I, I don't, I haven't seen the study, so I I don't know a lot of details on the findings of the study. I guess I'd have to read into it a little bit more. If ultimately, I, if elected, I'd do everything I could to promote the growth of Hillworth overall. But to give you an honest answer, I, I haven't seen that study, so I wouldn't be able to give you a good answer on that study. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, the idea of looking at investing, you know, and reinvesting in our downtown and how it could boost the economic impact is, you know, we have some gaps and we have some empty spaces. And so it's really looking at, um, as we're looking at the construction of the road and um, walkability, where people can park, um, how traffic is flowing through, it also um, is a key part of looking at what we want our downtown to look like and how do we invest in that infrastructure there and the buildings and um, the businesses that are in the heart of our community. And um, yeah, so I am looking forward to opportunities to visit with business owners, property owners, and look at ways to reinvest while we're doing this project. Uh, basically, with with the project coming through, um, you always want to attract new business to town. 
while taking care of the businesses that are already in town. Uh, you know, everyone talks about incentivizing new businesses. You got to make sure to take care of the businesses that are already there. Um, of a red flag for me, like I just mentioned in my last, is I mean, there's been obviously the traffic study. I, I haven't read all 193 pages of it. I skimmed through to make the, the bullet points, but um, you know, there's a lot of cars that come through Dilworth on a daily basis, uh, especially you know, we could talk about weekend traffic, things like that. They're coming through, hopefully stopping and spending some money. I, I'm afraid if you slow them down too much, they're going to find a way to go around. Uh, and that could affect businesses that are out of here right now. And, you know, it's just, it's it's something to, it's a point of discussion as this project comes around. Because uh, whenever there's a project such as this, never just cut and dry, there's always going to be more to pile off. Matthew. Get out and talk to people. That's how you figure out what people want with this, especially with this Highway 10. It's a big project. It's going to affect the entire town for years. And having the outreach study that um, it was actually done late 22, I believe it was, where they asked for public input <laughs> to figure out the designs and Especially in planning and zoning, we're we're looking at that and we're taking that and running with it and how we're looking at future for Dilworth and the rest of this and this as well. Just you make the question for me again, please. Yes, for sure. So make sure you put it back to the right page. Um, and in 2023, a downtown Dilworth uh, reinvestment study was conducted. This report suggested that improvements uh, suggested that improvements to Highway 10 corridor could boost economic development and citizen retention in the city. If elected, how would you work to promote the findings of this study? If I was elected, I would keep doing what I'm doing now. Um, there's representation from some of the downtown businesses in the room right now, and I think they'd be the first to tell you that I'm absolutely an advocate for them. If there's something that pertains to them, I reach out and keep those lines of communication open. Uh, with Highway 10 being reconfigured, we have an opportunity to make a reinvestment with our downtown. At council last night, we just uh, greenlighted a million dollar renovation job for one of our existing buildings, the old BFW. Now, our tax abatement isn't necessarily for new businesses that come into town. We can retrofit it to work however we want. So if we're going to be able to configure Highway 10 to get more people to stop and patron our businesses downtown, maybe that spurs some more economic growth that way too. Um. Staying with economic development, uh, and this has been touched on by multiple of you, uh, is that incentive piece. Um, so uh, starting with Julie, what uh, role do you see incentives playing in bringing uh, more uh, businesses and construction to Dilworth? Well, we feel that it makes a big difference. You know, and it, it puts us on, especially in the metro community, investing in that type of incentive helps us um, sometimes you know, stay within the same incentives that everyone else is offering, but it also gives us an opportunity to offer some uh, alternatives that can help entice businesses to be here. Like we have been able to work with businesses that where we can extend out the incentive at different rates. So it, it covers the same amount, but over a longer period of time where it benefits the business or we've been able to work with um, like, making slight like, like changes as um, development changes so that we can work with the businesses to do that. And so some of the incentives can be um, through financial and some of them can be through just working with the businesses on finding ways that um, work better for them in their development. Uh, just like I said before, the incentives are great. Dil Dilworth seems to be on the rise with it. Yeah comes to having businesses show up, you know, you have TSC that moved over from the more, more inside across the street over to Philworth. Um, I'll reiterate again that uh, instead of the great, uh, yeah, we well thought, thought through, so it's not a business that could be coming into competing and compete with an existing business that could put somebody out of business. 
thing a little bit. Uh, I really see that moved over from the more more inside across the street over to Philbrook. Um, I'll reiterate again that uh, instead of the great, uh, yeah, we well thought thought through, so it's not a business that could be coming into competing and compete with a existing business that could put somebody out of business. Thing a little bit. Uh, I'd really like to know the difference between Dilworth and Moorhead with the per capita and the business climate. It seems like Dilworth is very very strong. I mean, from a citizen's perspective, I'm not sitting at this table, and I'm so it's very very strong and getting stronger, and it's a great place to do business and. With the improvements that are coming around the city, uh, attracting that business uh, against, you know, what goes on in the state of North Dakota, which is a little, a lot more business friendly, uh, is is very, very, very important to do. Uh, having incentives for businesses coming in is actually making tax dollars work for us, because the more businesses come in, the more revenue you generate, the more tax space you have, and it kind, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy it just keeps building so that initial investment of let's say fifteen thousand dollars for a business to come in we end up making that tenfold back and so i believe those kind of investments are bold for the city so the incentives and abatements have been just an absolute home run for the city of Dilworth for many years now. Um, we have a two year abatement for houses, single family dwellings, uh, and that's a coupled on top of that is the, the school district and the county for if you build a new house in Dilworth, you get those abated. Uh, for businesses, it's up to a five year abatement. And that was one of the first things that we were able to do, I think it was 2021 when that first came into effect. And we have really seen the benefits of that. All the businesses that have come in in the last four years, and most of them are sticking around too. It's been a great success for the city. Uh, it's been a great revenue generator. And I think it puts Dilworth on the map as a player in the Metro, so. Thank you. I think the incentives are important. You are competing as far as going more ahead. And I agree, North Dakota is much more business friendly. So to bring these businesses in, you have to give them a reason to come. And you also give them, you know, you're creating more jobs in the area and you're bringing in more sales tax. Overall, you, you do generate a lot more benefit, giving up a little bit in, to that business for the short term. So I, I think it is important that we give those benefits and we continue to get those benefits. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> staying uh, kind of within the same vein of economic development, kind of looking at the other side, obviously we talked a lot about businesses. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit more to workforce uh, and employment issues. Um, and so just starting with, uh, we'll start with child care. Child care is a major concern for many families uh, in Clay County and across the nation. What tools does the city have to address this issue and how would you go about using them? For this one, we'll start with uh, Mike. Well, my wife owns a daycare. I won't be able to down. So, uh, the challenges for daycares right now, I would say, uh, you know, maybe there is a solution on the city level to help things get a little better. I think uh, the challenges that we face here are on a state level. Uh, there's the uh, just in the last probably five to ten years, it's become just way more restrictive. Uh, the policy has gone from 20 pages to 100 pages. It's uh, it's extremely redundant. Uh, there's a lot of home daycares across the state. Granted, we are talking about the city, but I mean, I'm trying to form it. I mean, it's gone from 18,000 to 6,000, I think, if I if I read correctly. Uh, it would be a great goal for the city of Dilworth to address home daycares. I mean, obviously, there's a center that just closed here. Uh, it's an extremely important thing economically for a community to have solid daycare because people need to get to work. So um, do I have a solution locally? No, but you know, it's part of being on this uh, council to, you know, maybe something that we could find locally that would work and help that problem and do what be a leader. Thank you. Matthew. Uh, I know you're a daycare owner. Uh, the big problems with daycare was profitability. It's getting enough kids and getting up staff and paying the staff. And that's one of the things that as a city, we could help with 
of the units and we could actually help with some child care costs if we want to. Um, red tape's another thing. It's we're in Minnesota. There's a lot of red tape when it comes to daycare. So, so what I would do is I would go bigger. I go county level. I I talk to my county commissioners, which I see a couple over here tonight, and I go to my state reps and state senators and have a conversation. That's what I would do. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I guess I would agree with these two that there's a lot of this is at the state level, but you know, you asked what we can do locally. And I think some small things that we can do and we are doing is you know taking a little bit of the burden, even if it's you know, you know, a couple times a month, like we do lunch with a cop, right? So the daycares around town that have kids that aren't of school age or even in the summer when they are, we're able to cater to them, you know, at least one meal a week, right? And it may not be much, but we're, you know, it's something. Um, the other side is it seems like the state has kind of declared war on home daycares. There's a lot of regulation, a lot more to come, it sounds. Um, you know, and I know when when my oldest was in daycare, they the Y had, you know, the 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 church, the Dover Lutheran Church was one of the sites, and that was shut down because it didn't have a fire sprinkler system. So there are businesses that have added those with the intention of doing uh, daycares after school. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a really tough issue for the local city government to try to fix. It, it is a big state issue. And there is a lot of red tape and government reg state government regulation in it. Of course, I, I don't know that there is a lot answers the uh, local well, city government could give you on the issue of daycare and child care. Other than maybe helping with some tax abatements on a daycare center. Again, you have the home daycares that again that's really tough. Ultimately would be trying to help find a way to draw in some larger daycare centers to the community. Thank you. So I think on a local level, if we're looking at it, there's, you know, one thing we can do to help them is advocacy. You know, there's, um, we can, uh, you know, speaking with the state, the legislature, things like that, because I know there's a lot that could make it really difficult to even have a home daycare anymore. And um, so as far as tools, we, you know, as a city, can also look at zoning. Like maybe there's things that we look at our long range planning um if you know in-home daycare isn't an option at some point because the state has somehow regulated them all out of business then we need to look at long-range planning in the city on where we could do more centers or where we could do some of that or do we do something with the community center that's another thing you know like is there a way we can tie it into our new community center i think there's options that we can look at by speaking to our child care providers and seeing what their needs are thank you <clears throat> Um, staying again on workforce, um, diving a little bit deeper into housing, kind of another big aspect of it. Um, a regional housing study was done uh, by MetroCog, and it suggested that uh, our region collectively needs about 16,000 housing units in the next 10 years, uh, a diversified stock of housing, uh, and a regional approach to tackling our, tackling our housing challenges and encouraging home ownership. What is the council's role in helping address this housing shortage in our region? I'll start with Matthew. I'm, I'm going to start by saying the missing middle. That was a, a theme on our planning and zoning commission. Uh, we talked about when we moved north and doing the whole 8th Avenue Northeast infrastructure project, we were talking about getting these some single family units, some double units, but mostly we were looking at in between apartment complexes on one side and the single housing on the other. They're, we're looking for townhomes, row homes, maybe lower density, high density housing. And we could help spur that and spur the discussion into alternatives to just a single family house, which we do have some, and apartments, which we have more, but some families are looking for something in between. And we should spur that conversation further. Thank you, Kevin. 
Well, it's like I said previously, I, I think the city has really set themselves up well for this to succeed. We've got the two year tax abatement for first time home buyers. We've got the five year tax abatement for a commercial project, right? So the tools are there. We just need the clientele, right? We need, we need to have willing developers with somewhere to develop and the options can be atlas for us. Setting it up is the tricky part, right? Like, cause we need to have that mix between the charm of your bedroom community, but the population density that's gonna be required for the Metro not to be overpopulated. So where those two intersect is the dance, but I think Dilworth is set up to participate very well. Yeah, yeah I agree the, the tax abatements are nice and that helps incentivize people to want to build here and move here. When I bought my house in 2020, you know, I bought a new construction, but I wasn't even aware of the tax abatement until after I bought it. <laughs> it was a nice incentive afterwards. I was, it was a pleasant surprise. Probably worked a little bit nicer if it was promoted a little bit better and people knew about it. The reason I want to move here is I want to live in a smaller community closer to what I grew up in. I didn't really want to live in something quite as big as more at a far. That was the appeal to me, but I think to draw that in and really take advantage of the incentives we've given, maybe promote it a little bit better and let people know that there is a better reason to build here. You do save that money building here. Thank you. Sure. So, um, I think a lot of the you talk about diversified stock. I think our disadvantage again is kind of the regulations on the side of the river. And so a lot of that is the advocacy we have to do again with like our state legislature. Some of it we had to do with cross footing, um, some of it with the sprinkler systems and some of the buildings um, when they were smaller and that. And it, it's things that make it difficult for um, developers and builders to do things in our community. And so it puts us at a disadvantage. And that's why we're missing some of that, that missing middle they're talking about as well. So I would like to, you know, look more into discussions with the builders about how we can find ways to create um, those more multifamily units that are not like apartment, large apartment building size, but more townhomes, more things like that, and how we can make it possible and in, in, in doing that with them. Thank you. Mike. And, you know, 16,000 of the Metro, and what, you know, what's Gil this year going to be about that? That's, you know, uh, with, I, I'd like to agree kind of with Julie with what she was talking about on the on the different types, not just apartment buildings, you know, duplexes, things like that. And obviously the new, uh, the 8th Avenue area between, Right now, Orchard and the Walmart area is uh, that that development is the key to is to getting more people into our community and, and not only just people, businesses also. Okay, thank you. Um, the last kind of question here on workforce to so this one, we'll start with Kevin on. Um, so overall uh, workforce, what partnerships and strategies are available to the city council to attract and retain? workforce in the region. Do you repeat that? Yeah. What partnerships and strategies are available to the city council to attract and retain uh, workforce? Well, we've got the Chamber of Commerce we can always reach out to, which is nice. <laughs> um, you know, all kidding aside, thanks to city staff, you know, Chad, Julie, Peyton, all the way on down, everyone that works here at City Hall, our relationship with our state legislators is unrivaled. Honestly, it, for for the population that we have, the amount of the attention that we get at the state level, I think even they would say are surprised. Um, not only that, we we work well with Moorhead. Um, they seem to generally have our best interest. You know. Uh, out at the forefront uh, as more of a community centric view. Um, so 
using all of those tools, you know, to our benefit has is really the key. Thank you. Can you give me the question again? Yeah. What partnerships and strategies are available to the city council to attract and retain workforce? That's not sure of the partnership so much. I mean, the strategies again would be taxes and making it business friendly to attract more of these businesses into our community to try to give them a reason to come here as opposed to Moorhead or even Fargo. I mean, we are, it is a smaller community. You got to have a reason to bring them over here. So again, you got to give them incentives to come over and uh, bring the business into our community and bring the jobs here. Thank you, Julie. So, um, I agree. I appreciate the collaboration we have with like the chamber and other um, groups in the metro area and how we all work together to kind of look at workforce issues. Um, and again, I'm I'm just going to do a shout out to our staff. They work hard when businesses come in to talk to them on finding ways to um, work with them to find it, whether it's the, you know, the property that might work or how to incentivize you can tax capital and financing, whether it's abatement. We also do some recognizing of businesses in our community with their Star City um, Award. And, you know, there's just different ways to show appreciation for the businesses that are here as well to help um, Keep them in our community and then um and I, I think that word of mouth with that then goes out to show other businesses that they may find it also another place they'd like to invest in as well so continuing with that yeah thank you i think i'd be better suited to answer this if i actually was elected right it got yeah, my nose a little further into the council business but i mean obviously the, uh Anything like this, you want to have partnerships with contractors and, of course, the chamber and anything like uh, any kind of relationships that are going to help build business in the community and attract workers to the city. Thank you, Matthew. City Council signs checks. Um, they deal with all the money. And as part of that, um, financial incentives like we were talking about, abatements and stuff like that, and also just talking to people. What do you want? How can we accommodate you in this town? And that's big gist of being in public service, talking to people, find out what they want. There goes my sign. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, moving a, a, over to emergency services a little bit and law enforcement, obviously, as we um, want the community to continue to grow, um, there needs to be uh, those services that uh, follow that as well. So um, what uh, what role do you see the city council playing in supporting uh, workforce uh, and funding for rural emergency services? And for this one, we'll start with Matt. I think city council is very important funding the rural emergency services. They're in charge, like you said, writing the checks. They are in charge of hiring the chief and hiring the fire department, making the right decision who they put in place there. I see how we handled the last chief change it was really disappointing in how they handled that, hiring an outside firm and paying them $25,000 to ultimately pick a guy from Madison and then have him turn it down to then give the guy, it seemed like every community wanted the job. Ultimately, we got the right guy, but not really because they chose to go that route. Thank you. Um, so rural emergency services like thinking about more rural areas that are not in the metro region is that where you know some of that and i mean we have some agreements with other communities where, where the the fire department is um you know we back each other up and i mean that's key and that, that was key when we were talking about our fire department and getting a new fire station is that we service a lot of different areas from here and so it's um we know the role it plays, but we also know that we need to be good neighbors and good um, 
partners with everyone else in the community and providing those services. And that's how we have to help support each other and continue to support each other to make sure everyone's safe. And so we continue to look at options, whether it's in policing or fire, on how we can work with other communities to do some joint services, because we know it is hard to recruit this time. Mike. Uh, you know, just the, the area it's, is kind of unique. Uh, I think the, the relationships between the police departments and the fire departments, whether it's Moorhead, Dilworth, uh, Glendon, uh, the police departments, Clay County Sheriff's Department, fire departments, uh, you see, you know, whenever there's something big, uh, anyone needs help, it's everyone is usually uh, stepping up to the plate. And, uh, you know, the, the fire station is it's on its way to being completed. And that's, you know, uh, the last one was in, in place for about 40 years or 41 years. Uh, this building done right could be twice that. You know, it's it's a good build for the future. So I think uh, as far as emergency services into the, into the county uh, and, and the council's going to share that, uh, I think uh, moving forward, it just seems to be a good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Shout out to the volunteer and fire, firefighters. Bill, thank you for your service. They're all volunteers. They don't get paid. Um, how I support uh, law enforcement, uh, making sure they're getting paid a living wage, um, making sure we get the right candidates, I think it's hard. Um, rural emergency services, uh, we have reciprocity agreements across different towns in, in the area, especially when it comes to policing. And um, I would strengthen those and talk to people and talk to people. Thank you, Kevin. As a member of the rural fire department in Dilworth, um, I have to say that the city council and the city as a whole does a really, really great job of supporting all the first responders, uh, not only Dilworth first responders, but Clay County Sheriff's Office. Um, to answer your question, the city has mutual aid agreements with most of the northern part of Clay County. Um, with, and also another caveat to that is in Clay County, the Fire Chiefs Association has what's called the box alarm system. So it, we've been called the Holly numerous times where they've had some pretty big fires lately. and the fire hall that our citizens have helped fund, 40% of the dollar, mind you, uh, is certainly a regional facility that they would have been boast for a long time. Thank you. Um, we'll start uh, this question with Julie, but uh, kind of wrapping all of the things we just talked about, uh, workforce, economic development, um, infrastructure, all those great things. Um, so, you know, folks across the nation are really feeling strained in, in, uh, due to increasing prices and are seeking relief from elected officials. How do you see the council working to maintain a strong level of these government services uh, that we just talked about while also balancing the tax burden on citizens? The council struggle. Uh, you know, I think for, that's sitting in the city council. I mean, it might be a new thing now, but that's something every budget cycle when it comes around that we're trying to balance. I mean, we're looking at, uh, you know, how do we meet the rising um, needs and wants of our community while not also increasing the tax burden in a way that, because we know it's not only our taxes that are going to increase, it's the county, it's the school districts, it's everyone, you know, it's, um, yeah. And so we need to work, um, to, to balance um, some of the wants with the needs. And um, I think that's something we've done well for many years. This is one of the first times, with, especially with the fire department that, and some road infrastructure, we've done some major investments um, that have kind of raised our budget a little bit more. But um, we do that with calculated, um, like what we want to invest in and how much we think they were, were able to handle. Thank you, Mike. You asked the question. Yes. Um, 
Uh, so folks across the nation are feeling strained due to increasing prices and are seeking relief from elected officials. How do you see the council working to maintain a strong level of government services while balancing the tax burden on citizens? Well, and I don't want to just echo and agree exactly what Julie said, but it is, I mean, it, it's a bit of a balancing act compared to what's the needs. It's uh, the scale tips and it tips quickly now. Uh, if you walk around this town and talk to people uh, like I've been doing, and that's one of the things that's first on their list is my property taxes are going up and up and up and up. And that's not completely on the city by any means. I mean, it, it, there's many other factors determining that. But it is the number one, and uh, it's it it comes down to what and what we need, balancing those out for what should be taken care of now and what the foreseeable future is with with the economy. And it's that's a that's a great unknown right now. So thank you, uh, Matthew. Now for some much care balancing the wants and needs first. Um, I'm not a fan of taxes. Again, I also know that there needs to be services that everybody wants. And so part of city council's job is to increase efficiency while decreasing overhead, which means if we have to make a penny squiddle, make a penny squiddle. And um, that's what I would do, I, I've already started, I've started auditing the city's finances on a personal level. Um, our city financial guy is here as well. He can back me up on that. And uh, so what I continue to do is do that and also look for alternative sources of funding, for example, state, county, even federal grants, and making those connections and seeing what we can do to decrease the tax burden on the community. Thank you. Kevin. So post-COVID inflation is certainly the big culprit right here, right? I mean, our tax dollars just aren't going as far as they used to. Like Julie said, uh, it wasn't everyone up here, frankly, but the balance is what can we do with what we have and what do we need to ask for? And how do we commit to a high level of service at a reasonable rate of taxation? Every budget cycle, we have to go through that. And there's hard decisions that have to be made. Um, I think that Dilworth can certainly post for the level of service and the amenities that we've been able to provide with the high inflation and still not go over, a, a, in my tenure, even a 10% levy increase. We always find a way to get the taxes down to where it's reasonable and regionally we're amongst the lowest every year. Thank you. Matt. I, I agree. You gotta look at what the community really needs versus what are just purely wants. And the things that we have to do, we have big projects, actually get multiple bids, make sure we're not just taking the first person and taking the word for what what it's going to cost, make sure we're getting the best value for what we're doing and really using our tax dollars most efficiently, sorry, most efficiently. Do what we can to avoid having to raise taxes at all. Having minimal tax increases is great, but if we can avoid ever having to raise them would be best. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, shift gears here a little bit and just kind of go into a miscellaneous section uh, of questions where we'll ask a little bit about you and then about the community, uh, very high level. So um, for this one, we'll start with Mike. Um, when you're faced with conflict or differing opinions, what strategies do you use to build a coalition and reach consensus? I deal with it every day with my job. Whether I have customers calling me for one end or employees calling me for another end, uh, it's number one is just to stop and listen, uh, get a general consensus of what's going on, and and try to solve a problem from getting the most information crop that you can possibly get on that problem. That's really the only way to start the process. Uh, many people can get angry, or it's just Pump the brakes, get the information, base the decision based on the facts. 
basically the way I come up. Thank you. Can you give me a question? Yes. When faced with conflict or differing opinions, what strategies do you use to build a coalition and reach consensus? Talk to people. Dialogue. Um, most, I guess, 99.5% of any conflict should be resolved through dialogue, even if it's agree to disagree. And then compromise. Because, you know, we may have varying views on a variety of topics, but usually you can come to a compromise that while everybody may not enjoy it. Yeah. I think the crux of your question is just exercising leadership skills. When there's conflict, obviously there's differing opinions. So to dig to the root of the problem and evaluate the facts and how they stack up to each other, and making an educated decision based on what you find is the way to go as far as that goes. Um, when you listen, you learn, right? So I guess I would just continue to find out what the facts are, even though sometimes you may have to make an unpopular decision to some. Uh, being able to get to the place where you can make a decision, an informed decision, and stand by it is the best thing you can do. Thank you. I, I listen to people and don't let my emotions get a problem. Get emotional, that's when things just get heated and you can't ever come to a consensus and you can never come to an agreement. And then, you know, discuss my side and hopefully we can come to some kind of resolution. Whether it is, as Matthew said, uh, agree to disagree. Thank you. Um, I'm a big advocate for encouraging dialogue. And so I think if you think of this, like if you're talking at the city council level, sometimes, you know, like people can be on one side or another side, but if we don't know why they're on one side or the other side, so it's the listening and everything, but sometimes, in, you know, you don't know why they're sitting on that position. So if you learn more about why they're at that place, this might not be like a decision that has to be black or white. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle that we can move to if we just understand why um, this side or this position um, doesn't agree with how something should be done or why we should go that way. And, you know, so finding middle ground if we can and moving that way and and um, just encouraging open dialogue in a way that everyone can hear what's going on and make decisions based on that. Thank you. <clears throat> Matthew, we'll start with you on this one. Um, what unique perspectives do you believe you will bring to the council and how will you use those uh, to strengthen Dilworth? I'm from the trenches. Uh, I've, I don't know, I'll, I'll admit it, I was homeless at one point in my life uh, when I was in my early 20s. And I literally built myself up from nothing. And so I have a unique perspective on what challenges everyday people face, especially with you know rising inflation, rising taxes, uh, lower living wages. It's I get it, and that's what I bring to the table is a completely different perspective. Uh, all my fellow candidates are great, um, but I'm pretty sure they haven't had to find their next meal out of the dumpster. So. There it is. Thank you. Kevin. Unique perspective. I guess to answer that, my 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 voting record speaks for itself. Um, there are a lot of great ideas that come through that door and get presented to us at council, but they're not all great. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm fairly certain, aside from one other vote, I'm the only person to have a dissenting vote in the last four years. Now that's it's not a brag, but it's it's factual. Being able to to say no when you don't agree with being presented, I think is is an attribute that should certainly be um you know, advocated at the council level. Thank you. 
I, I'm an outsider. I've never had any political office, never served. I, I'd be coming just as a citizen trying to serve. I own a business locally. I have to figure out a budget every month, figure out advertising. I have to make hard decisions, hard personnel decisions at times. I bring all that with me as well. And, you know, as Kevin said, he was the one dissenting vote at one point. I'm, I'm not afraid to disagree with the other members at times. I've seen their votes. They all tend to vote 5 0 on every issue. That seems a little odd to me that there's never a disagreement on anything. Thank you. Julie. I'm also a dissenting vote. I was the one that dissented when we put in an alley that a property owner didn't want. I was the dissenting vote. Um, also, when we looked at not having an open process of filling our police chief, I was I, I dissented. I wanted to have an open process to that, make sure the whole community knew. Um, I think my unique perspective is that, um, you know, making sure that everyone has a voice uh, is something that I'm very passionate about, making sure people feel included, they belong, they're part of the community, um, getting out and collaborating with our neighbors. I have been involved with many um, boards and committees in our community. I show up for the events that they offer. Outside of my role, I make sure I'm there, I'm listening, I'm hearing what their concerns are, and I think that's the unique perspective I bring to the council. Thank you. Mike. Uh, it'd be a lot of the same for me from what I deal with on a daily basis uh, with work. You know, it's you know, it goes back to listening, uh, problem solving, and, and bringing different things to the table, bringing different solutions to the table, uh, whether it's solution-based conversations. Uh, I mean, there's there's a microcosm of many different things that go on in this room, just like in any other boardroom in any other business in the city. Uh, sometimes on a larger scale, sometimes on a smaller scale, and it just depends on the project. And it's all about uh, collaboration is the key to getting anything done in a group setting. And it's it's the number one thing. And it, it sometimes takes a lot of work, uh, but when you get uh, a group of five people together that can, can venture like that um, and take feedback in from, from the outside people that they're supposed to, it's that's the way it's supposed to go. That's, that's another break. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, we'll start with you on this one. What do you see as Dilworth's greatest opportunities in the next five years, and how can the city seize it? We are sitting in a position right now where the metro is expanding faster and larger than it ever has. With our location in the metro, the, the possibilities are really endless. Uh, the one thing I don't want to see is that we're turning into a sea of apartment buildings like West Fargo essentially did. But what I what I would like to see, what I think our our biggest uh, attribute is, is the openness around us and the opportunities for us to build in a calculated manner that makes sense to the identity of who we are and what we want to see work to be and where our place fits in with the metro and how that looks so i think that our biggest opportunity is just the growth that the metro is spurring thank you matt yeah i agree our biggest opportunity is the growth of the metro our moorhead area is rapidly growing and more and more people will come this way i think we need to take advantage of that by promoting more business growth here, promoting more people moving here through tax incentives for businesses and continue with tax incentives for people to build here. But I think we got to do a better job promoting that so people know there is an incentive to build their home here and move to our community. Without them knowing, again, when I moved here, it was just a pleasant surprise. That's not the motivating factor for me. I think we do a better job of letting people know so they, that could be a motivating factor. Thank you. Julie. It goes back to a lot of things we've already talked about, right? Because our greatest opportunity is the next five years and how to save it, because we have the opportunity with redeveloping Highway 10, 
Um, it's an opportunity to look at our developments on the east side with the community center if the tax gets uh, approved. We can look at redevelopment. Um, we have the new fire department that we can look at some collaborations in the region to do some training there. Uh, we have housing opportunities. The planning commission has been looking at some um, development ideas that are great. We have um, working with Metrocon and the 8th Avenue and 15th Avenue study to see um, what are the opportunities for um, working with that infrastructure so that we can do some growth. I think there's a lot going on in the next five years, which is why I'm running for re-election, because I think there's just a lot of exciting things happening in Delworth right now, and I just want to be a part of that. Thank you. So my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is exactly, this is exactly the reason that I'm, uh, I'm super excited about the, the direction that the entire Metro is going. Uh, the city's growing the like, rep rate. Uh, it's always been it's always been a passion of mine to get involved in city government and Dilworth has the opportunities uh, to echo what Kevin said is there's not too many cities that are growing in this area that now aren't it, that have the space that Dilworth does potentially. Uh, I mean, Horace is growing huge. I mean, I think they just passed 5,000 people and what they were 10 years ago is not close to that. West Fargo, huge growth uh, on this side of the river. It's kind of perceived as a bedroom community, you know, and we want to get out of that perception and try to get more businesses over here and have people choose Dilworth first or their small town living in the big city. Thank you. Matthew. I don't admit, I like crunching numbers, uh, but uh, infrastructure, keeping, keeping on, keeping our tax dollars right here, that's, 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 that's how we're going to draw people because people are going to want to come here because we are actually investing in. Where they're going to live for hopefully the next couple many years, and so that's what I would do. I could keep talking to people, keep seeing what they want, and help drive the investments and kind of direct the investments as needed. So, and it's fun. Thank you. All right. So for our last question before closing comments here, um, I'm going to start with Matt on this one. Um, and this is a rapid response. So, um, two words, how would you describe the community of Dilworth? It's a hard one. It always it's probably one of the, the <laughs> toughest questions that we ask. How would you describe the community in two words? Small town. Home. Developing. Need some Saturday Night Live skits on this. <laughs> uh, I would say exciting and it's awesome. Uh, wow, the Saturday Night Live go through myself. <laughs> uh, hopeful and exciting. Mm -hmm. Matthew. Up and coming. That's a hyphenated word. Excited. <laughs> <laughs> Top notch. Thank you. All righty. Well, we'll uh, end the event with some closing comments here. Again, these are for uh, one minute each. Um, and we'll, for this, we'll start with Julie for closing comments. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to be here and for everyone that showed up to be a part of it. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. Um, I have been on the council for a while because of the, what where my passion is and um, being a part of the community and um, hearing what the needs are and addressing them. I um, am excited about the opportunities that are before Dilworth and I really want to continue to be a part of that and I'm looking forward to the opportunity. Okay. Uh, thank you again to everybody up here. Thank you to the chamber. Thank you to the citizens that showed up. Uh, I'm thrilled to be a part, to be able to take part in my government. This is the, the reason I'm here. Uh, uh, since in high school, we had a government teacher in high school that a lot of people know. Uh, that's uh, been in public service for a long time. I got a lot of people in this town excited about doing things like this. Uh, I figured it was the right time in my life for it. I'm very eager to serve the community doors, and uh, just, this has been a great experience. Thank you. Matthew. I like crunching numbers. I do. Um, if your voice wants to be heard, because I I listen, and that's probably the most 
important part of any public service is listening to the people who you represent and talk to people. And that's my whole platform. What do you guys want and how can I help? Thank you, Kevin. Thanks to the chamber, fellow candidates, and everyone for sitting through this hour and 15 minutes. You'll never get back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when 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 I when I was campaigning four years ago, it was the height of COVID, right? And I had a stick that I had my little flyer on, and I would, it was six feet long so that we could properly social distance and. Uh, Everything I had on that flyer, I've been able to put a check mark on in my first four years. So to have the opportunity to do it one more time, to see the community center through, to finish what what I what what we've what we've been doing and and start into the new chapter, Dillard, would be an absolute honor. So thank you, thank you for your time and thank you for your consideration. And thank you to the chamber for hosting us and thank you for the candidates being here. And I, I'm just, I'm not a politician. I've never ran for anything. I've never held an office. Strictly running is giving people an opportunity to vote for a change. Um, somebody that's not been in the office for 10, 15, 20 years. If it's something you want to do, you want to go with something new, please vote for me. If you like what you had the last however many years, vote for who you've had. Thank you. Well, thank you again to everyone for joining us this evening, and thank you to the candidates for participating in tonight's forum. Uh, for additional resources on the election, please visit votefmwf.org, which is our nonpartisan election resource um, designed to empower local community members with current information about local candidates, including those here today. A recording of today's forum will be posted there as well. Uh, we invite you to join us on October 23rd for our candidate Cracker Barrel event being held right here in Dilworth at the TAC Music venue off Highway 10. Uh, this event, uh, this Cracker Barrel event, offers voters with the opportunity to connect with candidates in a face-to-face -face manner. We hope to see you there, and thank you again, and have a wonderful evening. Okay. Great. Great. Great.